basically I wanted to follow up a little bit on Malia and uh, the story all over this past week was um, a paraglider, essentially one of the migrants who was gathering um, around Malia. Um, some witnesses in Malia looked up at the sky um, and saw a paraglider cruise right over the fence, drop all his gear and run off into the city. Ne- never to be found. So the first thing that I think about with this paraglider, first of all, good for him. Uh, that is, that's it. Right Amazing there. gumption, right? Yeah. Amazing yeah. gumption. And I think all of us looking at those horrific images, you got to root for the guy. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a life imitating art, basically, you know, just soaring, soaring straight over it, straight yeah. into Malia. Yeah. Do you think he flicked off the guardsman? Like if you're in that paraglider and they were looking at you, are you like, ah, yeah, yeah, you didn't think I could do this? I hope he had uh, spray painted a middle finger onto the paraglider itself. Yeah. That's yeah. that's actually what I hope. Well, and you were asking about the details. He was so successful. There are no details. People don't know what he looked like. It was it was like nearing dark when it happened. They couldn't see the paraglider. Uh, he hit the ground, cut it all off, and took off. No one knows anything. Recording from the awesome Frontier Tech Law Studios in New Haven, Connecticut, it's the 10 Billion People Podcast, where we talk about, in the most unorthodox way possible, about the issues of migration and global movement that are only getting harder as the world approaches 10 billion humans. Here are your hosts, Damian DeNoble and Eli McDonald. Welcome to episode three of the 10 Billion People Podcast. My name is Damian DeNoble. Eli McDonald. And on today's episode, we are covering the UK Rwanda expulsions. This is the plan that the United Kingdom under Boris Johnson came up with to take all the migrants that they think are coming into the UK illegally, ship them to Rwanda through us, through something new, something novel. Can't quite call it a repatriation agreement because those migrants aren't themselves Rwandan. Exactly. So it's more of a business deal. It's more of a business deal. It's a, it's a very cynical, possibly illegal Nobody's sure business. We're going to talk about that in the first half. We're also going to cover some interesting stories from around the world about uh, covering migration that we touch on in every episode. And then at the end, we're going to be looking at the story of Francis Nagano. Uh, in episode two, we talked about a place in Morocco called Malia, which we're also going to touch on today, where uh, there are these large, really tragic episodes of migrants from Sub-Saharan Africa mostly trying to enter the Santa Malia, which is on, which is Spanish, uh, to claim asylum, and and scores die. And we're, you know, I'm, I'm sure we'll revisit that many times over the course of the series. Um, but Francis Nagano was actually there. We didn't know that in episode two. I wish you know we covered Jokic, Nikola Jokic, but we should have covered Francis Nagano. We're gonna we're gonna uh, wrong that right in this episode. That being said, I think I set you up Makes for sense. our current events news roundup. This is in no particular order. Okay, this this isn't like this is what happened. These are just things that are interesting, right? The, the hope is as you listen to this podcast, uh, every episode will give you something you didn't hear about. And if you listen to enough of these episodes, you know maybe you're going to get a richer picture of what migration actually looks like globally. Right, okay. right. Yeah, I mean, this this first story, um, I couldn't believe it when I found it. Um, we had just covered uh, the, the Malia border, the most violent uh, the most violent border in the world, arguably. Um, or not arguably, it's technically the most violent border in the world. And I open up my computer, and I look around, and um, there's a story on paragliding. Par- this just Would, popped up in your Google alert? Uh, w- with a little bit of uh, enticement for me, but... Yeah. Uh, yeah, look, basically, I wanted to follow up a little bit on Malia. And uh, the story all over this past week was um, a paraglider. Essentially, one of the migrants who was gathering um, around Malia, um, some witnesses in Malia looked up at the sky um, and saw a paraglider cruise right over the fence, drop all his gear, and run off into the city. Ne- never to be found. That's incredible. Do we have any details on what the paraglider looked like? Is it is it store bought? Is it a Dick's Sporting Goods paraglider, or was it homemade? Because that's how I imagine. I imagine somebody taking all the rags that have been shipped over <laughs> from textiles factories in the U.S. and just day by day creating this thing, which is oddly romantic. And I'm probably wrong for thinking it. And I'm yeah. sure somebody will hear this and go, "That is so demeaning." But no, I, I mean that's how I'd imagine it. On the other hand, what if this was a test flight? Yeah. <laughs> you know, could you imagine? 
Okay, so if this what, is the new front, yeah. If this is the new front, right? That like, border is going to have to get built up. Well, when I talked <laughs> to, so I, I used to be in this bowling league in Beijing. Okay, it was a special bowling league. This yeah. was, this is, I was in Beijing the first time from 2007 to the end of 2009. And then I would, went back starting in 2014 when I had a company called Rukon Strategy Group, and we were bringing in senior care and uh, companies, home health companies into China. And I traveled all around the country for another two years. But in that 2007 stint, when I was a wee student, um, in my second year, going to third year, I entered this bowling league that was uh, the State Department Bowling League for the United States. Okay. So, That's... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So there, there were, there were uh, b- business executives from companies that were in the Beijing CBD district, Central Business District, okay. and then the State Department officials which are a combination of soldiers moving into foreign service, right. you know, the folks that process visas are among yeah. them. Yeah. Fun league. Everybody's incredibly smart. I thought I wanted to be a foreign services officer. Ended up going through all these foreign language schools um, in Middlebury, which is like the Monterey school for training right. spies, essentially. Right. right. <laughs> and, um, but you have to commit to five years at a time anywhere in the world. So if you want a family, your spouse better also be down with that plan. Right. And we had a very different plan. But what I heard, it, it was, uh, so in China, and this is true everywhere, it's not just a Chinese thing. When somebody gets a, a visa, right? So um, let's, say, let's say you're trying to get an F1 student visa or you're trying to get a tourist visa or an I-130. Um, there are forums that people use. This already in 2008. I would say, hey, I was able to get a tourist visa by saying this. And so in one particularly humorous case, Somebody got a B1, B2 tourist visa under the medical category. Okay. This is, this is still at a time when it was hard to get these, right? right? Under the medical category, to go get their leg replaced, to go get a new type of prosthetic leg procedure in the United States. Okay. Okay. All right. So the officer's telling me this. She goes, yeah, I thought it was like pretty compelling, right? I wanted to go to, you know, Texas Children's Hospital or something to get a new leg. Within two weeks. She has 30 applications for tourist visas wanting to ask for a prosthetic leg. Wow. Right? (laughs) Right? Right? So the information I've been passed along. So the first thing that I think about with this paraglider, first of all, good for him. Uh, That is, that's it. Amazing gumption, right? Amazing gumption. And I think all of us looking at those horrific images, you got to root for the guy. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a... Life imitating art, basically, you know, just soaring, soaring straight over it, straight yeah. into Malia. Yeah. Do you think he flicked off the guardsman? Like, if you're in that paraglider and they were looking at you, are you like, ah, yeah, yeah, you didn't think I could do this? I hope he had uh, spray painted a middle finger onto the paraglider itself. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's actually what I hope. Well, and you were asking about the details. He was so successful. There are no details. People don't know what he looked like. It was, it was like nearing dark when it happened. They couldn't see the paraglider. Uh, he hit the ground, cut it all off, and took off. No one knows anything. Nobody, but he would have had to report himself for asylum. No, he he may have, um, and they don't know whether it's him or not. So he's he's just in Malia, and then yeah, I'm, I'm sure you're right. I'm sure you did. What, what's the himself. population of Malia? I think it's like nine thousand. It's so, small. So it's small, it's but like, but it's like but it's mostly military personnel, right? I would guess. Or I don't think. So. No, 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 no. It's like it's a European port city. If you were dropped no in way. Malia, it's got European architecture. I didn't they're, realize they're on that. The Euro people go there for vacation. It's like littered with beautiful cafes. It's what? Okay, it's, this yeah. is like something yeah, yeah. we should have discussed last week. So you literally have four fences where there's a war happening, right? Of the European Union's own choosing, as we'll get to France and Ghana, has some very powerful quotes on this because he was yeah. there. And it's literally a vacation resort. I thought it was just oh, like yeah. a, a strategic stronghold for Spain. No, 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 no. This is a no. this is a quaint little European port city with uh, absolute on may- the African mayhem coast, just surrounding it on all sides. Yeah, that's wild. That is yeah. science fictiony. It really is. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. here's what it, what needs to happen. If you're if you're a journalist worth your salt. Right, which is a phrase that comes from the Roman army, right? Because the Roman army was paid in salt, oh, and salt is, used to okay, be a currency. Okay. The French monarchy grew rich in you know, the first millennium, in part because on salt. Okay, who cares? Wow, Damien, you know they should use more salt. of it in Connecticut with their cooking. But they should use anyway. more salt in Connecticut in cooking. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a little. That's a little comment. That's a little <laughs> ethnic hate comment. <laughs> who are you? Who's that? It's not the Italians. It's the English. Connecticut's English. You know, mostly on the coast. 
Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's fine. All right. Yeah, okay. Right. But here's what's going to happen. Any journalist with their salt is going to get a camera. They're going to go to Malia. They're going to point that camera at the sky for the next three months. Because I guarantee you, there is going to be a group of multiple gliders coming across those fences. Guarantee it's, it's wild to think about, but you're probably right. You don't want to make a bet on this? I mean, after your prosthetic story, it might be a bad bet. Yeah. To bet against it. Yeah. Okay. We no, need somebody you, you to bet against. Right. Yeah, we need somebody to get a bet. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. So that's wild. Okay. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, but it's become, you, you got here, it's, 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 it's not a, okay. So we, we were making light of it and we're cheering for this guy, but people are really dying at this border. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. How many absolutely. died? 23 dead in June. In June alone of this year. Um, 23 dead. Yeah. And, and those are not, those are not deaths. Um, that are prolonged necessarily. I mean, these could be really brutal deaths. You're getting caught in the barbed They're wire. They're mostly deaths by blunt force trauma, by beating. There um, you go. Yeah, yeah. So this really is is um, something we should be paying more attention to. So let's come back to that when we talk yeah. about Francis Ngannou, who's who's been through this hell, and he had some very poignant things to say and 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 whatnot. Okay, what's our next story though? Our next story um, cuts right to the heart of migration. Okay. Um, okay. Do you like Aston Kutcher? I love Ashton Kutcher. Of course, of course. I think every married to an uh, to an immigrant is he? Okay. Mila Kunis. Oh, Ukrainian. Obviously, they've okay. they've been big yeah, on yeah. the Ukrainian front. We should cover them. They they yeah. they have donated a lot to Ukrainian resettlement efforts in Poland, in particular. I think. Oh wow, good guys. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, I think like many young men in this country, yeah. I almost joined the Coast Guard because of Ashton Kutcher. Um, no, you didn't. What what is that movie called? Uh, Baywatch. You're talking about Baywatch. No, no, no. Where he's... Uh, Where he's... With, oh, I know. With Kevin Costner? Yeah. With Kevin Costner. He's a rescue swimmer in the Coast Guard. Uh, he rescues those fishermen yeah. off the boat. You think many people wanted to become a Coast Guard because of that? Oh, 100%. You're deluding okay. yourself if, if you weren't one of them, I think. Can I remind you that you're the guy who rode with your shirt off <laughs> on a motorcycle along the southern border? No helmet, mind you, Eli's mom. He had no helmet. And uh, you pictured your, you must have pictured, you'd be like, God damn, I'm, I'm so cool right now. <laughs> I think the type of man that wanted to become a Coast Guard after watching Ashton Kutcher mix it up with Kevin Costner. I think we're getting a little off point here. Is the type here. of man that uh, wears, yeah, go on, no, go on. But yes, everybody so, wanted to become a U.S. Coast Guard. Yeah, go ahead. Getting, uh, <laughs> getting to our story. Um, important questions of our times. Are, are Coast Guards super hot male models who rescue hardworking blue collar fishermen mm -hmm. from hurricanes mm -hmm. or are they frontline immigration militia? I think I know which one I would pick, but uh, increasingly uh, the latter is true. Um, so there's, there's really interesting stories from uh, both the UK and the U S um, this is the important question of our times. Yeah. I should have paused are, more are, after that. Are they the super hot Soup. He said, "Super hot." Su what was it? The super hot. Say <laughs> male that again. models. The super hot male models who rescue. His phrasing. <laughs> who rescue hot ladies? You're saving this attack. Uh, Our for when front we line immigration militia. <laughs> wow. Which which one would you choose? You like? I don't know. Are they super hot male models? <laughs> Uh, yep. All right. So on to the next story. Yeah. That's, that's it. Yeah. He's a super hot male model. <laughs> <laughs> um, they do have yeah. to yeah. work with their shirts on generally though. So it's out of the question for me. Yeah. Um, they also have to wear helmets when they jump out of the, the helicopters. So, so. I, I, two X's for you. Yep. Yeah, I agree. Two. I agree. Two. Okay. Um, but yeah. Jokes aside for a minute. We think we know what the Coast Guard does. Mm -hmm. Um, in the UK and the US, uh, other countries, I'm sure, they're being legally trained on um, on immigration law so that they uh, both know basically small actions that they take when they encounter um, a boat in the Mediterranean or, um, or you know, like, like we're going to look at later, a boat coming in from Nigeria um, into the Canary Islands. What they do, whether they accept someone onto the ship, whether they have another country come and pick them up, has huge implications for that country's obligation after. Um, so if they if they gather people onto their ship, they're automatically um, in the EU and in the EU uh, for legal purposes. So these countries uh, don't want uh, excessive obligations with all the people that are coming in. Um, so they're training coast guards. 
um, to take certain steps to sidestep those obligations. You know, who has been a pioneer of this in the West, Australia. So this is mm-hmm. a lot of what we talk about um, in this modern immigration system that we have is going to go back to Nauru and Christmas Island because Australia really was the first that I can think of to use Coast Bar to tell Coast Guards to stand down. And there was a famous mm. incident, I don't want to butcher it, where a Coast Guard stood by as migrants, I think from Indonesia, I, I could be wrong about that, were trying to, we needed saving. Yep. And they were like, no, 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 no. There's a few like, stories like, like that. Th- there's I, many stories yeah. now like that. Yeah. Because it triggers international obligations. Right. 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 Okay. So, but you asked, are they the frontline immigration militia, which, which to me is, is like a very proactive thing, but it sounds like they're the frontline immigration, frontline avoiders of duties to people trying to immigrate. Like, I mean, what that's, do you mean by that's, that? Yeah. That's, that's much more accurate. I think I was, I was going for a little bit of hyperbole with the militia. Um, CBP is much more of a militia. To me, right. like they've proven right. themselves to be pretty untrained. The Coast Guard, uh, I'll, I'll say this, Coast Guard seems to be a very well-regulated, as they're actually an official arm of the U.S. Armed Forces, yeah. where the CBP is an executive DHS Absolutely, control yeah. thing, right? Yeah, so yeah. It's, it's like a, a bit of a different thing. Okay, but, but go on. So Yeah, so I, th- I think more focusing on the front line uh, than the militia part there. Um, but yeah, they're, they're basically being trained um, to be kind of the first the first interaction that um, that these immigrants that these migrants have uh, with the country, and they're basically being trained to avoid um, as many of their obligations as possible. Um, It'd be interesting to talk to Coast Guard folks because I, I bet a lot of them were young, impressionable people who wanted to take their shirts off and right. convert with Kevin Costner and have a sense of duty and honor and don't like wearing helmets. Right, and I bet. When the Coast Guard was like, you actually wear helmets, 99.9% were like, okay, I can do that. And I bet when they were like, okay, guys, girls, you have to wear shirts most of the time. I bet you still 98% probably like, okay, I'll do that. 2% quit. 2%, the hyper, the, the folks that were like, they quit. But, who, but who don't then, want to accept mediocrity. Do, yeah, people. they don't want to accept mediocrity. But, but this is like a real thing. Like it does, again, I have, I have a lot of respect uh, for anybody that goes into this sort of service it's a dangerous job yeah the moral quandary has got to be pretty pretty immense i mean you're watching somebody drowning and you're hearing from up top saying you can't do anything right you know that that's a lot of mental suffering it'd be interesting to to hear somebody i wonder if we could find an interview on that yeah i think we should pull up more on that i was reading some accounts of um italian coast guard uh ships just yeah basically parroting exactly what you're saying having to um, sit there side by side, these ships, and watch people clinging to the outside of it, you know, dropping off, watching people die of exposure. Um, there, there are a few different Italian Coast Guards that were interviewed in this article um, who talk about severe PTSD. And um, yeah, so I, I think it's excruciating for, for a lot of people working in the Coast Guard. Um, and yeah, I mean, there, there's NGOs fire, you know, firing off lawsuits. Um, after almost every any one of these situations happens, you know, alleging crimes against humanity, and these coast guards are being positioned as, you know, the front line, as a, you know, with a lot of power over people's lives. So, so it's like their humanity is is brushing up against um, the power of domestic politics, which is trying to kind of push back on the obligations of international law. Exactly. And what becomes interesting is that these, this is true for a lot of. Uh, law enforcement officials, I found in my interactions with especially those who have retired or have gone on the record, you often get very, very thoughtful people mm-hmm. who have, in my opinion, sometimes an v- extremely uniquely informed view of immigration. Right. Right. Yeah. Where I think it's important in immigration, you have to cover both enforcement and you have to, what's called enforcement, you have to cover human rights at Mm -hmm. the same time you can't separate them and i think politically they tend to get separated as two separate issues when they're one part of the whole yeah and these folks have an idea of the stakes it's like hey i had to turn back a mother you know with a crying starving infant yeah holy crap yeah you know and i didn't know what to do i was a young guy i'm being told you know i didn't know what to do and they have a few years to think about it and they say well the thing we need to do is reform it and it comes down, it comes back into creating a policy and a legal framework for preventing those deaths. Because at the point 
where the death is happening, currently the legal framework prevents anybody from doing something unless they do something heroic that's going to be short term. And then guess what? They're going to be out of the Coast Guard and maybe even up for something like a court martial. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Or facing like our last episode, facing decades in prison and, you know, being prosecuted by the country that they're um, acting under. What was it? Who, who are you referring that to? Was in, uh, that was in Greece, two young, uh, like 22 year old students working for an NGO um, mm-hmm. who are being prosecuted by Greek officials now for like four different types of fraud. They're facing like three decades in, um, in prison for performing the role of positioning themselves on a hill and overlooking the Mediterranean and calling support when they saw, when they saw ships. And, and we, um, of course, we had the same thing happen with uh, Americans. And that's going to be an interesting episode one no day. No more deaths. Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Now, I know that crew. And I, and I worked peripherally with that crew. Um, some of their folks worked with this organization called Innovation Law Lab. I've been, been down a lot, a lot to a lot, though, in San Diego. And these are just like really passionate people yeah. who happen to believe in, um, in the power of their mission. And they were put on flight blacklists by yeah. the U.S. government during the Trump administration Possibly even before that, you know, I don't want to pin this all because I do think there is a government interest in this. So super interesting, right? The the, the overall story here is that the power of policy and regulation to completely constrain what can be done by the actors that are at the point of tragedy. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So the tragedy, by the time it gets to the final act where the person is dying or something horrible is about to happen is non-preventable. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Unless, you know, or let's say 99% of it's non-preventable because you might prevent one or two, but there's just not the ability for everything to happen unless yeah. there is a policy or, or legal yeah. change. Yeah, I feel like we're going to keep coming back to that, um, that point in these episodes um, that until we answer the big existential questions on migration, until each country is able to answer those questions, um, small preventable tragedies like this are just going to keep happening in droves and, and we're just you know and and, and there's a paradox right the, the paradox of that preventability is international law creates opportunities for uh cr- no creates the arbitrage opportunities or rather arbitrage of opportunity where mm-hmm. i'm in a really poor dysfunctional country i can't eat i can't have a job i don't know what to do with my kids i have to try and cross right yep and friends and is going to talk about that later and I'm going to try to cross into a better country. Yeah. The law makes it really hard to do that, right? But then once I get beyond borders, so if it's somewhere like international waters, where I'm in the absence of law, the absence of law then also makes it impossible to keep going. So it's both law and the absence of law that both act as barriers. And that is a paradox. Hmm. Think about it, right? Yeah. And so it's you're, you're talking about several different things but one is you have to reform the law in places where law exists right and you have to create law for these spaces that are devoid of it devoid of its power right so it's just super interesting to think about okay let's go to our main story let's go to our main story did you want to cover anything else on that no that's perfect okay that's perfect let's cover our main story which is uk and rwanda i think this is okay first of all boris johnson my sister-in-law, uh, one of my sisters-in-law, dated for a long time. She lives in the UK, and she dated for a long time uh, this really nice British man, kind of like, you know, on, a little more liberal or progressive. They were, they were at Cambridge or at Oxford or whatever, whatever, like one of these really fancy schmancy places. And he was an environmental. He did a PhD in like environmental engineering. I think he went to the desert and the Sahara. Mm. And he figured out um, how to uh, turn sand into glass and somehow use that for the generation of energy. Wow. Okay. If you could turn sand to glass and use that glass to create solar conductors, the desert could potentially be a source of wealth. Fascinating. Yeah. Fascinating guy. That being said, at one of our Christmas dinners, well, not that being said, that's, uh, that's about that, that indicates that he did something wrong with that. Being the case, this guy being real, and me being a jackass. <laughs> and it was like 2018. I was like, you know, like Boris Johnson seems to have some good ideas. Mm. You know, that to him was like basically me turning into Kanye. <laughs> I was like, that was, that was basically Kanye and Alex Jones. He's like, well, what do you mean by that? That's horrible. I'm yes. not going to try to do it. Like, what, <laughs> what do you mean by that? <laughs> I'm 
I'm like a baker's assistant. It's 17th century. <laughs> what do you mean by that? Yeah, I kind of said it in that question, <laughs> questioning. Wait, wait, I said, well. So you did that accent. He broke up with your sister-in-law and you haven't seen him since. He, it might have okay. been because okay. of that <laughs> accent. And so, and what I was trying to tell him with that, uh, with that story, uh, you know, and I'm not sure if that's why they're no longer together. When I said, uh, you know, Boris has it figured out. I was trying to say he's a good guy, but this time, this is before Brexit. And I thought that Boris had come to the natural endpoint of conservative politics in the U.S. and the U.K. And looking around broader now, probably in other parts of the world, where government didn't matter. Things were moving on their own. Government didn't matter. Things were moving on their own. And the role of the political leader was just to be performative. To hit the rifts. If not further dismantle. If not further dismantle, but at, at the very least, just hit the rifts. So here's this comical buffoon. I mean, just satirically comical. Yeah. And he's just hitting the rifts of xenophobia and all these other things. And, you know, that was his role. It's like, he figured it out. That's it. He figured out that he just had to be a performer. But then Brexit happens. And what you have there is a runaway train of one of these performative ideas that, oops, accidentally turns into reality. <laughs> and now we're looking at a UK whose economy is in free fall because COVID's also coming, whose migrant workforce is gone or leaving, and hilariously, who has a bunch of older, richer, who are now UK migrants living in Europe who have to come back <laughs> home, right? And that's the context in which this UK is going to send people to Rwanda Don Cheadle's Rwanda <laughs> happens. It's it's it seems like it's another one of those performative acts, but yet here we are talking about it. It doesn't make sense to me as not a performative act. Make it make sense. What is it actually? Making it make sense is a is a tall order. I think uh, it's absolutely a performative act. First of all, um, but I think there it also makes sense. Um, there, there's two big things that really um contextualize this for me uh number one what was the one of the main pillars of, of brexit was border protectionism right controlling our borders um and two boris was going into an election at this point and the outlook was not great um like you said brexit is struggling right now you know this is uh their dream of cutting themselves loose is turning into a nightmare in a lot of different ways um so yeah, this, this just worked for him on on a lot of different levels. Um, it, it showed that Brexit was worth it, essentially, or that's his messaging. You know, look, look what we can do now, um, now that we've you know achieved Brexit. Um, and you know, there there are twenty eight thousand people a year, um, roughly coming over. I think the the year before through the channel, through the channel, through the yeah, channel, through the yeah. channel. Yeah, and and just really quickly, what this um, what this policy is is people who come illegally. Yeah. So not anybody. Okay. Uh, people who come illegally are going to get sent to Rwanda. Um, and it can't, you can't just you can't just be anybody. I, I I think you have to enter illegally. I think so. It's okay. Does does this smell a little to you like Martha's Vineyard that we discussed in a the lot past like episode? Martha's Vineyard. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. Because because Martha's Vineyard was Ron DeSantis and before him, Greg Abbott in Texas, who's still sending migrants to New York saying, oh, this is going to play really well to my base. And ultimately it's entertainment, right? Like, ha ha, really funny. Like sending a bunch yeah. of people up to Martha's Vineyard, look at them scramble. And here, Boris Johnson, right? Comical buffoon. He's always been right. The life of the party guys. It's, it's kind of funny, right? I mean, it's, I mean, it's a good place for Rwanda. Don't you, uh, Wait, you guys don't like me sending people to Rwanda? And he kind of winks at his uh, support. He goes, why? Yeah. Is it because they're a blah? Is it because it's a blah country? A bloody Berlin country? Yeah, he was absolutely daring his political opposition uh, to use that tactic and to um, degrade Rwanda in any way. Uh, he, was, he was daring people to do this. And it's the same thing DeSantis was doing, um, sending people. It's a beautiful Martha's Vineyard. Because Ron DeSantis is saying, well, oh, don't you, oh, you don't want these people here? What is this? Is this, is this, but okay. So both of them, to be clear, crystal clear, you have to have a sense, no sense of the humanity of these people to even make these sorts of, well, I don't want to call them policy decisions 
to 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 create these sorts of stunts. And it question remains: Is Rwanda a policy? That's my question for you. Is it a policy decision that's going to last? Right. But you have to completely dehumanize people. You have to be on like level five of dehumanization to put a policy like this in place. Yeah. This is this is not your simple uh, kind of like grandpa dehumanizing. Um, because you're putting on a plane, on plane, this plane. Is, you're like, you're going to Hotel Rwanda. Yes. It's like, I, I've heard about that. And Don Cheadle did a movie about that. That doesn't sound fun. No, 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 no. It's okay. It's okay. Okay. Dude, tell, just tell me, tell, tell me, let me ask you this. Can this Do, actually? Can it actually work? Yeah. Can, can you, can, can the UK actually send people to Rwanda? Like, why or why not? Is, is it a real thing? I mean, again, is it a real thing? This, yeah, I was about to say this, this gets back to this being a performative act. I think the answer is no. I think the answer is no. I, multiple people have crunched the numbers on this. Um, we should mention first off that this is happening. Um, a hundred people were initially sent uh, a couple months after this policy was put in place um, on two different plane loads. Um, so it is happening. Uh, but people, and I cr- think some people were sent back by Rwanda because they actually couldn't oh, be really? there. Yeah, there's like some weird thing. We keep going. Oh uh, yeah, that that actually does ring a bell. Um, People who've actually crunched the numbers on this say it could be twenty-five to thirty billion dollars a year. Uh, a year? A year? No. To make this happen. So that's three hundred billion over ten years. Yeah. Yeah. Essentially. So it's whether or not there's actually political will to spend that amount of money on it. I I really don't see how um, how this could happen. I I think this is a runaway train, but uh, a train with no track in front of it. Okay. Here's my counterpoint to that. Here's my counterpoint to that. Now, um, and it always goes back to Christmas Island and Nauru. So Australia, which pioneered, let's say, in the Western world, this idea of sending people to not letting them into your country, you know, whether it's uh, not letting the Coast Guard pick up folks in mm-hmm. dinghies. They also kept people on Nauru, right? Christmas Island, where uh, folks trying to get to Australia are sent to this island instead, which isn't part of Australia. And it costs something like 500000 to a million dollars to keep a person there for the year. I have to say that this is essentially a, a Russian nesting doll. This is Australia replicating itself. This is a former island, a former prison colony creating another island prison colony. And who created the original prison colony? The UK. UK. Okay. This is fascinating. My, my, my mind is turning, but I'll say this. Despite the fact that this Russian nesting doll costs millions of dollars per year for the people being held there, despite the fact that there are clear abuses, the Australian conservative governments and conservative politicians still support it, even though that bringing somebody into the country, integrating them into society, even if you pay them 30 years of benefits, that would be cheaper than keeping them on mm-hmm. the island for a year. They mm-hmm. still support it. So my argument for the fact that Rwanda could still happen is that apparently the perceived political value of shipping uh, migrants to a different place like Rwanda or Christmas Island or for Denmark, they want to ship folks to Morocco. That's Denmark's plan is seen as higher than the actual cost, right? Of doing a real world plan. So the imagined political value, right? Fantasy value is seen as much higher, perceived as much higher than the actual cost. And that's why I think it could still happen. Is there any other reason it might not happen? I mean, the the only place that uh, there's this huge contradiction that basically falls right um right in the UK's lap. So Boris has just put all of his eggs into border protectionism uh with with this Rwanda plan and uh then Ukraine uh starts to boil over. Oh boom. Yeah. Ukraine yep. happens. Yes, yeah, so you have uh refugees flooding into Europe, flooding into the UK. Um, and initially Boris Johnson and the government are just absolutely dragging their feet. Um, I, I assume because the messaging on this is just impossible. Um, how do you treat two distinct groups of refugees, um, who are functionally the same legally, um, in a different way? You know, how do you do that? And people in the UK are just getting absolutely furious that, that, uh, Boris isn't doing anything about these Ukrainian refugees. Um, he's not letting, so th- th- just to be clear, they're furious at the point we're talking about because he's not yet letting anybody in. Not now, but when this is happening, they're furious because they're like, do something. You got to help. Is exactly. That-, that he's not creating any special circumstances for Ukrainians coming in. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. So, so, yeah. So, so they're, ba- they basically push him, um, into what becomes, uh, this political scheme that the UK puts out scheme, he scheme, says. scheme, scheme, actually not, not my words. That was straight from, a. Uh, uh, from UK media, 
um, the Ukrainian scheme. Essentially, they brought in 144,000 Ukrainians in under in right around six months. So, so um, what is it? Is it just like you show a Ukrainian passport and you come in? Are there any regulations? Essentially, I, I think you fill out uh, simple forms. Um, that part of it is pretty cut and dry from what I read. Um, but this scheme includes some really interesting things. Uh, UK citizens are given an incentive to essentially host uh, Ukrainian families and Ukrainian refugees in their homes. Um, and you, there's some quotes here that, that are just, that are just priceless when, when you're looking at this contradiction. Um, one, you, one, uh, one London resident said, this is very easy to decide. People were in awful situations. Uh, that's then, not what they said. Say it, say it the way they say it. I think you have the, uh, <laughs> no, let me show you how it's done. Okay. Let me show you how it's done. Okay. Thank you. And where is it right here? Let's see. Yeah, right there. There you go. It felt very easy to decide. <laughs> People were in awful situations. It felt very easy to decide, my lord. Okay, it's coming together. People there it were is. in awful situations, and I just felt my heart flutter. Okay, that's exactly. how they said it. That's how they said that's it. That's how they said it. And then, yeah, people talking about the biggest thing they're concerned about with this scheme is whether or not the Ukrainians will feel comfortable in their homes. Amazing. Amazing. You so, know what this is exactly like? The U.S. program for Ukrainian refugees. Okay. Okay. Yeah. For those of you not familiar, let me look into the camera. For those of you not familiar with how U.S. immigration law usually works, uh, let's say you're a U.S. citizen and you want to bring your uh, U.S. spouse from abroad here. You're going to file an I-130 petition with the USCIS. It's going to take 8 to 12 months to get approved. Once it's approved, you're going to file the DS-260, rather your spice of spouses, DS-260 immigrant visa form. She's going to have an affidavit of support that has to be filed in her name by the petitioning spouse or qualifying joint sponsor. Then it's going to take like many months for those documents to get looked at because our current backlog is about 300,000. It mm-hmm. was up to 500 some thousand, you know, in 2020, we've brought it down to about 300,000. Hmm. And then once it's documentarily qualified, which can take a long time, you will eventually get an interview. The whole process can take two and a half years for some people, okay, and has been taking that long since COVID and the end of the Trump administration. And that's a long time to be split apart from your family, unless you have the money, which most people don't, to travel back and forth to whatever your country your spouse is in. Right. Okay. That's how it's supposed to work. Right. Okay. Supposed to work under our system. I filed. For uh, one of my clients had a Ukrainian spouse, not even living in Ukraine. We got approval to come over here filing one form, the I-134 affidavit of support. It took two weeks. Two weeks. She's here now. We're filing now the adjustment of status package where, you know, she'll have a green card. Probably within normal processing times for when you file in the U.S., but I don't know. I wouldn't be surprised if that was fast track too. Two weeks smells pretty open borders aid to me. Yeah. So... Exactly. And so I yeah. like that they call it a scheme in the UK papers that you brought that term in here because it shows you that the power of a border okay, is completely dictated by the politics of a country. Absolutely. We're told, well, we need, to have, we need to have public comment on a new federal regulation. We need to have Congress do X, Y, Z before we can help all these people. I don't know why we can't get rid of Title 42 at the US border. It's so hard. Impossible. 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 But in fact, it is a political choice, and that's what this highlights. Right. Okay. I mean, all we have to look at is <laughs> is Boris's own messaging. I mean, he's he's talking about this roughly twenty eight thousand people a year who are crossing the channel, um, and you know our systems are being overrun. We are being invaded. Uh, we can't possibly uh, provide healthcare, housing, jobs to this many people. It's completely impossible. Hmm. Then. I would like to go to one of his officials talking about this uh, Ukrainian sponsorship scheme, scheme uh, which brought in 144,000 people in under six months, as we said. Uh, this quote, this is a global game changer in terms of refugee sponsorship scheme. So you can... Wait, 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 wait. hold on, hold on. That was the most beautifully bureaucratic favor, uh, flavor of asinine I've ever heard. Can you... Yep. Read that. I haven't heard this before. Read that to me one more time. Yep. This is a British official glowing with pride okay. over the Ukrainian scheme. Okay. 
This is a global game changer in terms of refugee sponsorship schemes. You know what that sounds like? It sounds like a marketing executive announcing a new line of Katy Perry cosmetics. Mm. It's the same energy. It's the same energy. It's like, a this is a global game changer in watermelon <laughs> lipstick. <laughs> People are going to be able to look fabulous and taste good to themselves all day. Mm. Very important. Yeah. 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 You can, you can practically feel how satisfied the person speaking is with the smell of their own breath. <laughs> <laughs> So, exactly. so, 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 so they see this somehow as a global branding exercise. Okay. Yeah. I mean, what it demonstrates yeah. to me is amazingly, yeah. some of the richest countries on earth actually do have the room and capacity to take in refugees. It's wild. And they've pr- not only have they proven that it's possible, you know, 140,000 in, in six months is no small feat. Uh, they're proud of it. They're super proud of it. Okay. All right. So, so but, yeah, ultimately it's a, ma- a matter lives, of will. Like, the, it's like it's said, a matter of will. It's a matter of will. Uh, but yeah. this lives, to be clear, this lives in parallel with the UK's Rwanda plan. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Stick with me here. I think there's an irony here. All right. I think there's an irony here. I'm going to try to flush it out. Are you familiar with uh, Rwanda's uh, 1994 genocide Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, Hutu and the Tutsi. Yeah. yeah. 800,000 Tutsis were killed by Hutus incited by hate radio. Okay. Right. And this is the, this is the official kind of narrative in, in less than 60 days. So it's considered, uh, it's one of those weird Guinness World Records records, the fastest genocide in modern history. Okay. Hmm. Um, do you know why the Hutus killed the Tutsis? Oh my, this is going to go so, oh, my brain is just, okay. The Hutus and the Tutsis were real ethnicities, sort of, tribes. Yeah. But when the British took over Rwanda, right, they were uh, at their heyday, right, at the top of the, when the British Imperium was stronger than ever before, uh, they took, uh, they were great scientists. You see, they loved, uh, the British loved physics. They love biology. They loved eugenics. Uh, yes. Eugenics was the cream of the crop. You see, and so they came into Rwanda and they said, uh, "Oh, these tootsies. Uh, let's see. Give me some t- people who are tootsies, okay? Give me some people Hutus." Uh, rule one of colonialism is that you create uh, divisions among people, right? Split and conquer. Yep. And eugenics gives you a tool to do that. And you go, "Oh, these uh, tootsies." Uh, you say, "Oh, they seem very tall." Uh, a lighter brown skin, maybe shorter noses. They're craniums. Very nice, agoid shape. Uh, these Hutus, uh, not so much. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. And they bring it back to the queen. You know, they're like, oh, listen, uh, the Tutsis are going to run stuff. They're, uh, she's like, oh, okay. Uh, why? Uh, tall, egg-shaped heads. All of them. Not a single individual. It's not a small sample size issue. Trust us. Science. Right next to physics and biology. See that uh, dinosaur uh, fossil? Well, check out this Tootsie head. They're going to be our bureaucrats. And the crazy thing is that the Tootsies then were given leadership positions in the British colonies, right? Mm. They were given additional power. They were essentially made to lord over Hutus. And then the Hutus, funnily enough, figured out, hey, wait, we're Hutus? And that makes us inferior. And so now they get, wait, but before we were just kind of like different tribes and we were living together. And so this builds naturally resentment that yada, yada, yada gets to this point where you have the Hutu genocide of the Tutsis, which some people see as an uprising, wh- whatever it is, terrible thing. So the irony mm-hmm. for me is this, okay? Here you have a British government that's saying, uh, okay, here's our scheme. Uh, this one, there's a multiple tier of refugees. The Ukrainians, they get in, but these guys come from the channel who just happen to be uh, from sub-Saharan Africa, Syria, Syria, Mm -hmm. Western Mm -hmm. Asia. They're kind of down here. You know, we call this, we don't do eugenics anymore, but we call this uh, the law. (laughs) (laughs) This is now just called the law. Let's not talk about the root. This is just called the law. And so the irony is, that uh, they are now sending part of this uh, scheme, which is 
a, a eugenics ordered scheme involves sending people back to the country where uh, England already did a proper job of setting up a right proper job, a right proper job yeah. of se- <laughs> <laughs> of setting up a race based bureaucracy. Yeah, yeah. You, you can imagine the sale being. Uh, oh no, no, no! You don't have to worry about Rwanda. They know exactly where these people fit in. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. They've got experience <laughs> with racial bureaucracy. Believe us. And then, uh, and then they were like, Wait, but "This is so odd. Where did you guys even get this idea to send people to Rwanda?" Oh, that's the best part. That's the best part. You see, 300 years ago, we pioneered sending people to an island in Australia. And here's the craziest fucking part about that. <laughs> the Australians started people sending people to their own island, which Ooh. isn't even theirs. Nesting doll in nesting doll and nesting doll. But here's the irony, Eli. Mm-hmm. The nesting doll has blackface. Yes. Yes, it does. And yes, it does. Okay. And, and so now I'm the nesting doll also had their high school graduation at a plantation. It turns out it turns out yeah. it turns out yeah. it's, it's impossible to look away from this. Okay. And yeah. again, no yeah. discredit to Ukrainians. I'm glad they're, you know, getting help, but it is selective and right. it is scheme based. It is not right. law based. We call it law based, but it's choices that we're making. I, I think there's a question uh, that I came up with researching this where in case you do not see the contradiction here. I think this may be able to to tease it out. Do you think it's possible that the UK will send any Ukrainian refugees to Rwanda if they enter illegally? I do. Okay. Not the answer I thought. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. You're asking a lot with that question, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Again, it goes back to the question is, is profound in that it has embedded within itself the knowledge that the folks that aren't being let in right now, I want to stop saying folks, it's such a weasel word. Plus Hitler use it. It's not a good one, right? The verf, the, 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 you know, vol- folks comes from Volk. Oh, in German. Interesting. Yeah. 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 Huh. yeah. That's a, that word's so, always yeah, me the wrong way. Yeah, me yeah. too. Yo, Obama <laughs> used it a lot and I was like, oh, stop using it. That's a Hitler word. I, okay. But anyway, I was, <laughs> so, uh, the, the people that aren't being let in, uh, into by who are crossing the channel, who happen to be from Syria, sub-Saharan Africa, Western Asia, who are legally the same entity. Yeah, legal, yeah. Legally the same entity. Yeah. Um, those people, right, um, are not Ukrainians, right? So yeah. it's not like Ukraine would all of a sudden get the same treatment because we know it's uh, it's the historical law. Yes. It's the historical yes. law. Don't ask where it's from. But what I'm <laughs> saying is if we want to, uh, if the UK government gets wind of this contradiction being a political problem for them. Well, then I think they would make an example, quote unquote, of a Ukrainian refugee who maybe didn't have access to a computer to fill out a form because it can be still kind of complicated, decided yeah. to go across the channel and like try to send them to Rwanda. Like, uh, you, you know, because there's yeah. no, it's, it, it's not, they're not rational. There's no logic and it's performative. Okay. Yeah. And so yeah, this yeah. would be another piece to this performance. So I don't think about them as rational actors in the space of policy, in other words. Just because they've right. created this bifurcation does right. not mean I give it respect as a rational bifurcation because it's not. Again, it's performative. So right. why not introduce another act into the drama and send a Ukrainian to Rwanda? Yeah, okay, true. Let, okay, <laughs> let, uh, let me give you Let me give you an example, extreme example, but not that extreme. Actually, the question is, is this an extreme example? Okay. If tomorrow you wake up and you open your BBC app okay. and you see the following... If you see the following, um, what what was the quote? What was the quote? The global, what what Mm, would they call it? Global, a global game changer. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Global game changer. So fucking good, that language. Mm. Okay. Here's the quote from the BBC tomorrow. The British administration has announced a new global game changer. Starting January 1st, 2023. All refugees entering illegally onto British shores will now be sent in accordance with a properly signed agreement into the hands of our friends, the Taliban. (laughs) And then the lead is like, most people think the Taliban are bad. (laughs) This is not true. (laughs) They have promised that all refugees sent into their hands will be properly trained in all the things that the Taliban deems important inside or, quote, outside their territory, (laughs) except for women. 
Women, quote, will be shown a thing or two, unquote, quote, it won't be school, unquote, quote. Yeah. Triple quote. This <laughs> was in no way a publication done in conjunction with the UK government. You know, okay, if you saw that headline, Huff Post would make it shorter, what a, you know, would you say this is not really happening or would you have to research it a bit before you convinced yourself it wasn't happening? Uh, Boris Johnson played a heavy hand here, so it could, it would not, I mean, if you think about uh, the jump from not having this policy to sending people to Rwanda, it's a, it's a big jump. It's a big jump. So another big jump could get us pretty close to uh Expatriating people to the Taliban. Yeah. Well, not any expatriating because they were never our patriots, but just sending people into, you know, uh, governments that we know are bad. Now, yeah. now I want to yeah. say this about Rwanda because I, I, I want to uh, people. Rwanda, in some ways, is very stable, mm-hmm. right? Very stable country in Africa. And that's why Boris plays this game of trying to get you to say, if you're in his opposition, try to play, say, oh, why is it a bad country? Go ahead and say it. Right. right. Because in his mind, it really is just a country that's a black country. Yeah. Right. And there's this latent British racism that's very close to the top of mm-hmm. uh, the mind whenever you talk to somebody from, from Britain. But Rwanda's pretty stable. They've had a longtime president. He has said publicly that he wants Rwanda to be the Singapore of Africa. Mm-hmm. Both a financial hub, maybe he was thinking before cryptocurrency had this crash, maybe crypto would be the thing, um, but also a hub that shows Africa the future. You know, hmm. like Africa has big cities. Um, he's mod- He's trying to put in infrastructure, trying yeah. to create a modern economy. And what these agreements, so Rwanda has other, other, other agreements, right? Because they want to be the Singapore right. of Africa, but they have other of these agreements. They, none currently in place that I know of, um, but they did have this agreement with, with Israel. Um, that did not last very long. I think there's, um, issues with human trafficking essentially in in Rwanda and Israel decided we, uh, well, well, Rwanda sits against the Congo, which right now on its border, I was watching a documentary has at least like 50 independently armed groups, 50, 50, five, zero. Um, and the Congo is. I mean, it's, it's a crazy place. Okay. Our, our patron, a patron saint of prodigal sons that we both love, Anthony Bourdain, he did an amazing Congo uh, episode. I've got to watch that. Okay. That is maybe yeah. his greatest episode. I, I think he literally goes a little insane on it. Like he does the full kind of heart of darkness, oh, Joseph wow. Conrad ride. Yeah. You know, it's one of his heroes. Yeah. But he also shows you like these cities where the streets have been paved over by lava from volcanoes where everybody lives in fear of the next raid. And that time there were only Mm. 20 or so armed groups, you know, near where you, but anyway, I digress. Yeah. The point is that Rwanda is stable in some ways, but it's an incredibly unstable area. It's surrounded on a good chunk of its, you know, uh, borders by the most unstable country, non-country on earth. Congo is a country, but got the question for another day. Right. Um, And so that's, that's part of what makes it crazy. Like if you, if you just know anything, about where you're sending people. And by the way, can we talk about the fact that it, in 2022, it's possible to send somebody that's made a journey of 3,000 miles, like send them back 3,000 miles into it a different direction. Just, yeah, for some reason, what sticks in my head uh, with this is this one account I read of a, um, a family of Syrian refugees who'd, who'd survived um, a good chunk of the civil war um super long arduous uh journey to to get to the UK cross the channel and yeah and then it's sent to Rwanda <laughs> and that for some reason yeah just like you said traveling yeah 3000 miles and getting sent 3000 miles in the opposite direction it's just it, it's unbelievable to well, me well we'll yeah. see where it goes yeah. so th- so yeah. there is a court decision coming up you right. said on this to to tell us whether this is going to stay in place there is I, th- I think it actually comes out this month that essentially turns on the legality of um the safe third country provision it gets pretty in the weeds um but like we said this has happened um people have been sent um the actual legality of it is pending uh, this so is a, will- if somebody claiming asking for um asylum mm-hmm. at your at your border has passed through a safe third country between when they left their country of origin and got to you. It's whether you are legally obligated as a country to take them in. 
Exactly. Because yeah. there's a third country clause in the 1951 mm-hmm. convention. UN convention, yeah. UN convention yeah. that, that says if somebody passes through third country, then the, the uh, obligation to take them in doesn't have to be triggered, right? And there's right. there's a lot of litigation around what a safe About country transit is. Transit through and yeah, yeah. And transit yeah, it gets through really complicated. when somebody actually got the stop, like if they were smuggled in you know, the bumper of a car. Right, or, or actually, what requirements uh, designate a safe third country exactly. Safe, so, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Fascinating. Okay, so let's go to, we're going to have a short second part of the show today. Yep. Uh, we talk, We every time in the second part of the show, we take somebody that is well-known, uh, that has something to do, that have some portion uh, of their lives have an immigration component to them. Right. And there's plenty of picking. And uh, last show, in episode two, this is episode three, we had, as we talked about at the top of the show, talked about Mal- Malia. Malia. Yeah. And turns out that one of the great UFC champions, one of the great stories of all time, Francis Ngannou, um, who many know his immigration story. So Francis Ngannou is a uh, Cameroonian national. Right. Okay who starts fighting at age 26 in Paris. Yep. He spends a childhood building up strength in the salt mines. Mm. And after starting to fight very late, he comes to the UFC and becomes an overnight sensation, just yep. knocking out people left and right. And you look at him and that is uh, a chiseled, incredibly strong man. He's a specimen. He is, he's a specimen. He's a big man. One yep. of the most athletic individuals I've ever seen. Here's the thing. What people know about him, if they l- listen even a little bit to a story, is that he tried to enter Europe seven times. On the seventh time, he was successful. And he did it on dinghy boats. Yeah. Okay. Like yeah. little dinghy boats that three people should fit in. He crossed the Mediterranean on that. Right. To try. Well, that, was, that was the seventh time. Six times before that, uh, he was a member of, uh, of these large groups rushing the border in Malia. And that's what I want to get to, right? And yeah. not only that, he went from Cameroon... He had to get to Morocco from Cameroon, and he talks about in multiple interviews about passing routes where there's just multiple skeletons, and he says, I know what those people went through. That could have been me. Right. But he's part of these, he's part of at least one uh, incursion into Malia, and he says in an interview, it's subtle, but it's there. He says he was left with scars from the barbed wire. Hmm. Okay. Hmm. So... The the paraglider we talked about at the top of the show that made it over, Francis Ngannou was in that in that scruff. So yeah, few things. What talent that guy has displayed? He's literally the championship of the champion of the world in yep. mixed martial arts. Yeah. Um, he's one of the most athletic people ever, and he couldn't get across the fence. That kind of jumps out at me. Okay. Right. What jumps out at me the most though is how he talks about his experience. Yeah. Um, he's given very frank accounts. You know, he posted on his Instagram an image of him when he gets out of jail and detention in Spain. He was put into detention in Spain when he crossed over. Right. For a few months. He was there for a few months in detention and his hair's all grown out and he's wearing this Reebok shirt, which he would later turn into a symbol of his strength. Oh wow. Right. Wow. But it was a Reebok shirt that you see a lot with African migrants who have imported textiles that come to their countries. There's a whole right, right. economy around that. Actually a billion dollar business. Yes. Uh, the textile recycling. And he becomes somehow from a stateless guy on the streets in Paris. He describes sleeping in garages and it being like a Ritz Carlton to him after his experiences. Right. He was left without documents, without, he, he had nothing. He, was, he had nothing when yeah. he was released from detention, yeah. right? But he can't be repatriated back to Cameroon because Cameroon doesn't have a repatriation agreement with Spain. Oh, wow. Okay. Wow. That's why he can't be sent back. So he makes it, and then, and then he's allowed to wander. And if you've ever been to Paris, you see the impact of a lack of repatriation agreements and a lack of any sort of plan by France or any other nation of what to do with these stateless migrants. Wow, yeah. Right? Yeah. And so somehow he makes it from there. But when he talks, he goes, I can't even watch images of what's happening in Malia. And it was in response to, there was an event where 23 people died that we mentioned. Right. And he said it gives him PTSD. Yeah. You know, for days, and he has to just sort of sit there and remind himself, "You're not there anymore. You're not there anymore. You're not there anymore." Yeah. And then he says, "I don't understand why people don't see us as human beings." And you know, people and us is defined in that sense. It's people in yeah. Europe, people in the West, us. It's myself and other people who are coming from places that I am. Right. But what makes us different 
from the Ukrainians. He asked that question. Hmm. And so semantics and whatever, you know, policy discussions aside, if the Ukrainian scheme is a scheme and a choice and the Rwanda scheme is a scheme as a choice, okay, but we should never forget that it's, and can't forget, and can't forget when we make these choices that these are actual people. These are champions of the world. Exactly. That we aren't letting through. Um, and yeah. so that that's what jumps out at me. What jumps out at you? Yeah, I mean, he went, listening to his interviews, um, I, I think what's stuck with him um, is exactly what you said, the dehumanization. And I think once a human being experiences that, especially in the, the scale that he experienced it, um, I don't know if you ever do fully get over that, you know, watching, watching like systematic dehumanization by a nation state against a huge group of people. Um, and yeah, I think, I think he says it best himself. He just, um, he hasn't been able to escape that once you see that up close. Um, you yeah, know, I, I can see a scene in a, in a documentary about Malia where at first glance you have four fences and you have a, a, a mass of bodies that we've talked about that are taken by propagandists and turned into kind of like horror flicks when they're talked about, right? One of the best known books that's revered by the right by figures like Steve Bannon talks about a mass of brown people overtaking Europe and has ties to this great replacement theory. Right. But imagine, right, a piece where instead you have this mass of people coming in and you highlight each one. You go, yeah, this guy's a... You know, a little tropey, but yeah, this guy's a doctor. But maybe this guy's like a really good guy. You know, he's a he's a really good electrician. Yeah. Go, this guy's a fucking world champion. Yeah. Right? And fighting. You know, this guy's going to be a leader of a nation. Right. You know? And that's what gets lost. Each one of those people has potential. And when they die on those uh, barbed wire fences protecting... Uh, a uh, Spanish, apparently port, tour, port city, essentially port city, tourist yeah. port city. Each one of those is a great loss. Yeah. Um. So yeah, Francis Nagano, he's a champion, champion from Malia. He's a he's a brilliant guy. He's worth um, it's worth listening to some um, some of his interviews. He's really well spoken. Um, that and, that might be the first guy I'd want on this podcast if we oh, ever get a once one day. That'd be good. One that'd be day. Good. Well, that's it. That's it for episode yeah. two. Thank you guys for listening. This 10 billion people podcast where we think about a world where 10 billion people are one day going to exist upon it. And we still got to figure out the key question. How do we deal with them moving around? That's right. Thank you all.